Um, good afternoon, relatives. Um, I'm not sure if all of you have been here during our previous panel, but my name is Paula Antoine. My Lakota name is Wopi Lui, and I'm fortunate to have another um, uh, Wichokan Awaiakoni, and I'm Sichangu Lakota, and I'm the moderator for this panel, and I would just like to have our guests, our panelists, introduce themselves, and I'd like to start with um, Tyrell, please. <clears throat> Hau matake api chante na pe chu zapilo hokshila luta mielo na tarao maza pankaeska machi apilo oyuk pe amata ha wapila tanka shuma shayate. Greetings, relatives. I'd like to uh, greet each and every one of you with a warm, heartfelt handshake. Uh, my name is Tarao Ironshell. Uh, my Indian name is uh, hokshila luta. It was given to me by my grandmother. And um, I'm from from uh, the Oyukbe Band, which is uh, Crazy Horses people in uh, the Oglala Lakota Nation. And um, I would like to thank the the Shumash Nation for for allowing us to be here in your territory. And and uh, I would also like to ask for forgiveness for for speaking uh, before the elders today. Um, I I uh, started you know um, in camp. I went up in August, and I stayed until uh, almost January. So, like right at the end of December, we decided to 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 leave. And um, you know, with the the youth council, there was so many of us. You know, we had camps in each of the different. We had a camp set up in in Rosebud Camp. We had a camp in Sacred Stone, and we had a camp in Ochetti Shakoi. And after camp, you know, it's it's the same way. We have a chapter in Denver. We have a chapter in South Dakota, a chapter in New Mexico, a chapter in um, Illinois, you know, West Virginia. And so, you know, it all started from, from uh, the, the, the youth, you know, the, the young people who decided to take the future into their own hands. And they decided that they were going to take these peti petitions to the Army Corps of Engineers. And before, you know, all of that happened, like right before that, I was doing a lot of uh, community organizing work. Uh, I work with a group called Native Organizers Alliance, and we had a training for trainers in Seattle, Washington. And I had heard this story, and this, this story is about a little bunny. And, um, you know, back, back in the old times, we would come together, you know, the, the leaders, the Itanchan, they would, and the matriarchs, they would come together in the lodge, and you know they would they would talk about whatever needed to be talked about. And in this story, there's uh, three leaders. There's the eagle, the bear, and the wolf. And there's also the little bunny. And in in old times, we would when we would meet to talk about things, we would do it in like a council lodge, like, like the one that was erected at uh, Ocheti Shakoin. And uh, in this council lodge was, was the three leaders talking, you know, the, the, the eagle and the bear and the, and the wolf. And this, this little bunny, he, he had something, you know, that he, that he felt had to be, you know, heard. And he was excluded from, from the council meeting. And so this little bunny, you know, he, he stood outside of the lodge while they were having their meeting. And he, he sang a song. You know, they were inside talking, and, and they could hear him outside singing his song, you know. Yo, hey, yo, hey, yo, yo, hey, yo, hey, yo. And the wolf, uh, he says, you know, I'll go outside, and I'll take a look. And he goes outside, and the little bunny is standing there singing his song. Yo, hey, yo, hey, yo, yo, hey, yo, hey, yo. And Wolf says, hey, uh, little bunny, you know, can you keep it down? We're trying to talk inside, and we, we're trying to, to have counsel, and, and you're interrupting us. And he just keeps on singing, you know, yo, hey, yo, hey, yo, yo, hey, yo, hey, yo. So the wolf says, well, you know, I, I have a solution to this. And he goes up to the little bunny, and he rips his arm off. You know, he can't hold his drumstick anymore. He can't beat on his drum. Problem solved. And so he goes back into the meeting. And they continue to, to talk about it, uh, whatever they're talking about. And they hear it outside again, you know, yo, hey, yo, hey, yo, yo, hey, yo, hey, yo. And so the bear, she says, well, I'll go outside and I'll talk to him. And she goes outside and she says, you know, little bunny, can you keep it down? We're trying to have our meeting. 
and he just keeps singing his song, you know, yo, hey, yo, hey, yo. But only this time, he has, he's holding the drum in between his legs, and he's beating it with his one arm that he has. You know, yo, hey, yo, hey, yo, yo, hey, yo, hey, yo. And the bear, she says, you know, well, I have a solution to this problem. And she goes to the little bunny, and she takes his arm off so that he can't beat on his drum anymore. And, you know, just to, you know, to add to that, she took his leg so he can't hold his drum anymore either. So she goes back into the lodge and, you know, they continue meeting about whatever, whatever it is that they have to talk about. And, and they hear it again outside, you know, the little bunny, yo, hey, yo, hey, yo, yo, hey, yo, hey, yo. And so the eagle, he says, well, I'll go outside and I'll check it out. And he goes outside and the little bunny no longer he's drumming, but he's dancing. He's jumping up and down on his one foot. Yo, hey, yo, hey, yo, yo, hey, yo, hey, yo. And, you know, this little bunny, can you keep it down? And we're trying to have our meeting and you're disturbing us. But, you know, he keeps jumping up and down, singing his song, you know, yo, hey, yo, hey, yo, yo, hey, yo, hey, yo. And she says, well, uh, well, he says, I have a solution to this problem. And he goes up to the little bunny and rips his head off. You know, problem solved, no more singing. And they go back into their, into their meeting. And then they hear the little bunny's song again, but only this time it's real faint. Yo, hey, yo, hey, yo, yo, hey, yo, hey, yo. And so they all decide to go outside and have a look. And when they go out there, you know, the little bunny's body is still there. And, but they can still hear the song faintly. You know, yo, hey, yo, hey, yo, yo, hey, yo, hey, yo. So they go up to the little bunny and, they, when, and when they go to inspect it, they realize that, that this story, that this song that he's singing is coming from his heart. You know, and, and they realize that, that they can't stop him from singing his song. There's nothing that they can do. So they, they give his leg back and his arm. They put his head back on and they, they invite him into, into the lodge and they let him sing his song. And you know, whenever I saw these kids running to, to Washington, D.C., and you know, even on their way there, they found out that, that the construction for the Dakota Access Pipeline had been improved. And you know, they still decided that they were going to take these petitions all the way to Washington, D.C. You know, they didn't let anyone stop them from, from singing their song or delivering their message. And you know, that's, that's what really inspired me to go to Standing Rock, was seeing people younger than me you know, doing these things. And, and me, I have been working with organizations since, since high school. And I was 15 years old when I first started you know, working with community organizers. And doing that kind of work, you realize that there's not a lot of young people out here doing this work. You know, there's not a lot of young people who, who care about, about their, where their water comes from or what's in it. You know, not a lot of people care about the hardships that their people face because they're too caught up in it. You know, and, and to me, it was like, like seeing the, these young indigenous kids, you know, and it was like, we're still here. You know, and then it makes you want to ask other people, you know, my age or younger, like, what are you willing to do to, to make a better life for, for your children? Because you know, when, when we grow up, we're, we're taught not only to think about ourselves and our families right now, but also to start thinking about, you know, what, what is yet to come in the next seven generations. You always have to think seven generations ahead. And like my sister Jaceline said, this isn't, you know, this is land that, that our children and our grandchildren are going to inherit. And it's up to us to leave, to leave it, you know, livable, you know, so that they can live good, they can have, have clean water, you know, and, and, and you know, just, just all of these things. And it's, you know, when people came to Standing Rock, they, it was like, you know, every, every person who came, you hear the story of, you know, we, we don't know why we're here. You know, it's just this feeling, I was drawn here. And, you know, that, that's, that's prayer. You know, that's prayers from our ancestors. They knew that, that we were all going to have to come together one day. And so that feeling, and also the feeling of being in camp, and people are like, you know, this is surreal. You know, I've never felt this way before. You know, I, I feel so loved. And to me, the way I see it was, you know, that, that feeling that you get, you know, when, when, you, when you cut down a barbed wire fence, you know, whenever you go and set up a new camp, whenever you go and stop construction, there's this feeling that overcomes you. 
and people don't know how to deal with it. You know, it's, it's sovereignty. That's the feeling of freedom. And people don't know that, how, you know, it overwhelms them. You know, and, and now that camp is gone, people are like, you know, they, they yearn for that feeling when, when you can make that, that change in your own communities. You can inspire these people. You know, and, and, and at the camp with, you know, with the youth council, it was, for us, it was about bringing in these young people and showing them that they do have a voice, showing them that it is powerful and they can do something, they can make a change. You know, we have to, we have to take our power back. You know, for, for so long, you know, our voices were, were gone, you know, and, and, you know, we were silenced, we were oppressed, and now, now we have that platform. And, you know, we've always been here, but, but, you know, people don't see us. They don't see us every day. They don't see us on the news. They think that we're extinct. They think that we hunt buffalo and live in teepees. You know, all of these, all of these different things, you know, it, and it's like, you know, it's up to us to show them who we are. It's up to us to show them that we're not here. And that, you know, if you don't respect us, you better expect us. And, and to me, you know, there was a lot of, you know, like on the, when we went, would go to the front lines, you know, there was people who didn't have, like, nonviolent direct action training. They didn't have community organizers training. You know, it was a lot of people's first times ever doing something like this. And, and you know, it's, it's scary being in those kind of situations, especially if it's your first time being up against, you know, 100 riot police or, you know, LRADs, rubber bullets, you know, all of, all of those things that, that we had to face, you know, and it was a part of putting fear into us because when, when they can make us afraid like that and people don't know how to handle that, you know, it, it makes them fear for, you know, not only their safety, but for the safety around them. So you would have people who, you know, we would go to the front lines and then we would get there and, no, go back to camp, you know, don't do that. But, you know, that, that fear is coming from the wrong place. When, you know, you don't want to be afraid of the wrong things. You know, if, you know, don't be afraid of, of being abused by the police. You know, don't be afraid of, you know, uh, going to jail. Be afraid of what's going to happen when that pipeline breaks. Not if, when. And what is going to happen to your family? What is going to happen to your house and the land? You know, your grandchildren, you know, what, what are you leaving for them? You know, so, you know, don't, you know, and don't, not want to say don't be afraid because, you know, it, it's natural. You know, we're human beings. But don't be afraid of the wrong things. You know, and, and I've always, you know, like I was just telling my uncle here that, you know, when, um, like, as, as youth, you know, we, we are too often overlooked and overheard. And, you know, people, you know, we do get excluded from things. But as youth, we have to learn how to use our voices and speak up. You know, we have to be able to, you know, ask ourselves what, you know, how long are you willing to let, you know, your life be dictated by someone else? How long are you going to let someone else uh, make decisions for you? You know, we, we come from, from a long line of warrior people. Are we not warriors? Do, you know, we, we let people decide, you know, decide what we eat, where our food comes from. You know, there's no sovereignty in that. And we're Lakota. You know, we have to be sovereign. You know, it's all, you know, because everything that, that camp represented, you know, we're, we're occupying this land because it's ours. It's treaty land. And, you know, we, we were all there to protect it. And, you know, this, this kind of, you know, opportunity that was placed in front of us you know, it wasn't only for us here. It wasn't only for us at camp. It, it, it's for our families for the next seven generations to come. You know, everything that we do, you know, it's, it's all about the future. And, you know, we're just in the Youth Council, you know, and also, you know, with a lot of our allies, we were, you know, there were a lot of people who helped us, you know, get to where we are today. You know, like, like IP3, Indigenous Peoples Power Project. 
you know, now we're, I'm on the board of directors for that. You know, we, I work with, uh, you know, three different organizations and, and I have a full-time job, you know, and, it, and it's hard, but, you know, growing up, you know, in, in the white man's world, you know, you have to, to be able to do this. It's like, um, in the, back in the day, there was uh, this, this, this man named White Bull, his uh, hunk papa, and he asked his dad, he said, Dad, you know, there's, there's all of these washichus, these, these, you know, the white men, they come and, and, you know, they destroy everything and they, they use everything like, like, you know, like grasshoppers. And, you know, what, what do we do? How, how do we help? You know, what can we do? And his dad, Sitting Bull, he says, you know, uh, well, you have to learn the ways of the white man. You know, you have to do as they do. You have to be able to infiltrate them. You know, and so, so there's this talk about colonization, and it's a talk that needs to happen, you know, not only amongst us indigenous people, but, you know, other people. And, you know, along with that, we also have to, have to remember what Sitting Bull said. You know, we have to be able to, to walk, you know, in this white man's <coughs> world. But at the same time, you have to remember who you are. You know, I'm Lakota, and that's who I'm always going to be. And so you have to keep that bond in between you and Mother Earth. You know, you always have to keep that strong bond, that spiritual connection that we have to the Earth, the earth each and every one of us. You know, because we, we all come from the Earth. It doesn't matter what color you are. And so, like, we always have to remember when we're doing you know, the business things or when we're trying to, to do things in the white man's world, to always remember who you are. You know, walk in prayer. That doesn't mean to, to sit in camp and pray that, that the pipeline goes away. It means to pray about guidance and what to do next. You know, pray, pray for courage when you're on that front line. You know, not, not stand, stand there and, you know, with, you know, sitting on your hands and, and praying and wishing that something's going to happen. No, you pray for guidance, and then you go out and you make something happen. And you know, for for us, you know, the youth council, it's it's all about teaching, you know, everything like like that I've been talking about to to these young kids, because you know, it, the earlier you start it, like you know, our people my age, they're just now getting into it. But you know, if you have young young kids, you know, elementary kids even, you know, if they if they know, you know, what I know now, you know, they, you know, they could really make a change in this world. And so for us, it's all about how do we get to those kids? You know, you know what, what can we do to, to not only, you know, teach them, but make them want to be involved? You know, and, and so uh, I'll, I'll just leave it there. I feel like I'm talking a lot. <laughs> um, thank you, Tara. A lot of times in, in indigenous gatherings and in, in and different events that we have, things happen for a reason. And as I was going to start talking about um, why this panel was put together, um, Tyrell answered that whole thing and and what it means to walk forward and to realize the importance of what's happening to the human race. We're at a crossroads. We have come to this crossroads to get together, global warning, warming, and how we're going to reach and achieve the things that we're doing together, and how we're going to impact our earth and our world with the things that we're doing, but we're doing that together. And I was talking with Todd, and one of the things are, and he touched about it, and it really, you know, his story really means a lot to a conversation that Todd and I were having about the amount and the population of indigenous people in the world, you know, we're 2% of the population, and we, we hold 60% of the <coughs> Earth's resources that is needed for us to continue. And we are the little rabbit and our hearts and our culture and our way of life is what's going to keep us going. And so we are in that position to move forward with that political strength and that cultural strength and that environmental strength that we have all together. And I think that's, you know, and I would just like to move on with 
um, with our next panelist, but I just that was the introduction that I wanted to say, but in combination with Tyrell, it made more of an impact. Thank you, Tyrell. Michael. Thank you. Michael Cordero Cacti. Hello, my name is Michael Cordero. And I'd like to start out first thanking each of the panelists in, on today's panel like, with their good words and with all the work that they've done at Standing Rock. Um, I think that it's been easy for the Chumash, um, the coastal band of the Chumash Nation and the Chumash that have, have been here to identify with what goes on in <clears throat> Standing Rock or what has gone on in Standing Rock because we have faced similar situations. And back in the 70s, um, on the place that is now known as Point Conception, but we call them Kak, which is the western gate to um, where the, the souls leave the world, um, they attempted to put up an LNG, liquefied natural gas plant. And um, Chumash, along with allies from different nations, um, Native nations in the United States went out and camped at Umcock for almost a year and eventually were able to defeat the LNG plant. So I think we have an affinity with the people at Standing Rock because we understand <coughs> the nature of what, what went on. You know, the, the people there at um, Umcock had to face the police, they had to face road closures, all of that. Um, and I think all na Native peoples, and Chumash included, on a daily basis face the kinds of um, challenges to the environment that we hear about in, um, in Standing Rock. You know, we just recently, within the last year, had a, a oil spill in, near Gaviota up, up the coast. And um, we see that on a quite often basis. And if you live in Santa Barbara, you've, you're from the Santa Barbara area, you know that there have been um, pipelines that have spilled or oil that has spilled on a, on a regular basis. And, and as somebody said, um, it's not a matter of, of if, it's a matter of when. And so we know um, recently <clears throat> Chumash from the northern counties, northern county of San Luis Obispo, along with other allies, um, defeated a proposal to have a train that would transport oil from a terminal up near San Luis Obispo down the coast and would pass through a number of populated areas. So. Like I say, we understand and we identify and, and we're able to feel an affinity with, with the people at Standing Rock in that way. And it's something that we all face um, day to day. And the, the bands of Chumash, the different bands, all work on this um, issue on an ongoing basis. So I think that... Um, the lessons that that we're bringing, uh, that we're hearing from Standing Rock, are the lessons of working together and continuing to to um, form those alliances with other peoples and with other nations uh, to continue the work that that has been going on. Thank you, Michael. Joy. <laughs> There's a lot of things that have happened, and I know that, um, you know, with the topic that we're talking about with decolonization and indigenous leadership, um, you've had the opportunity to see several different um, tribal leadership, forms of tribal leadership and structures, and so maybe you can talk a little bit about that. Holy. Uh, my name is Eagle Feather Woman. I'm from Cheyenne River Sioux Tribe, uh, Eagle Butte, South Dakota. Um, yeah, I was up there, Sacred Stone and Ocheti. Um, 
Right now, I'm currently taking care of displaced water protectors after we were forcibly evicted and removed by gunpoint. Um, and those were live rounds, by the way, in February. Those weren't just your rubber bullets that are, you know, like that big round. Those were live rounds we were facing. Um, so right now I'm taking care of, of, of water protectors that are displaced. And we're gearing up for um, the fight against Keystone XL and continuing the fight with Dakota Access and um, uranium bore mining um, and disposal of uranium waste in our Black Hills as well as potential uranium bore mining just eight miles south of my reservation. So that's four water fights. Um, we talk about decolonization and the different types of leaderships that I run into. I also work for Indigenous Environmental Network part-time. So I, I have the unique opportunity to go and visit with um, different tribes and not only just the IRA tribes, those of you know anything about IRA, it's, uh, that's the form of government that the United States government kind of puts its stamps of approval on. Say, yeah, we'll, we'll follow those guys. Indian Reorganization Act. Uh, but I also have the opportunity to work with treaty leaders. Because a lot of people don't understand that we still have treaty or traditional councils. So like on my reservation, we have the IRA, the approved government, <laughs> as well as our traditional governments. And, uh, you know, when people say, oh, they're having council, well, you know, in, in American society, people think, oh, they're having council, they're having war council. That's not true. There was always different kinds of council. There was peace council, there would be education council, there would be women's council. Uh, so there was always different things that were going on, and never any one specific leader like Americans have a president. Uh, so I, I have the unique opportunity to be able to meet and, and interact with a lot of different tribal leaders. And there has been a lot of that patriarchal Western society, um, top-down ladder approach that has seeped in because, I mean, let's face it, we live, we're, we're we are, nations within a larger nation. Plus, we all have cell phones and TVs and everything else, <laughs> right? Facebook. Um, but at the same time, what's happening right now is a lot of a, uh, what started in the 70s and late 60s about uh, learning to, to go back to our traditional ways, learning our, our languages and our, and our ceremonies and our cultures. I remember going to Sundance when I was a little girl and looking up on top of the hill and seeing the FBI with their black cars and their guns pointing at us. Um, so I can remember that and I can, you know, tell my, my children and my grandchildren, at least we don't have to face the FBI right now. Now, I do go to some, some ceremonies, and, and the FBI still fly over occasionally. <laughs> but that's, you know, they fear us, and they fear prayer. And you see that. You see that up there at Standing Rock. You see that at these other camps that are come, coming up. When Terrell was saying that, you know, they're, they're about prayer and prayerful action. I've always talked about prayerful action. And that's something I've always talked about with the youth with that, with prayerful action. Prayer doesn't mean sitting in camp on your thumbs singing kumbaya and whatever else. Hippie song comes up. I'm sorry, if there's any hippies. <laughs> Maybe not. <laughs> but um, it does mean that you pray for guidance. And you act, you say a prayer, and then you act as if it has been solved, whatever problem you're working on. And you go out and you do. You don't stop doing. And some of the elders, which we never got names from, would come 
and say, the elders are saying, you can't do this at Standing Rock. You can't go up there and be do this at the front line or whatever other action we were planning on doing. Yeah, we can. Because <laughs> we're taking back our sovereignty. <laughs> we never did anything violent. We didn't do anything violent. I remember the, um, I think it was during Treaty Gap when they came in and they, they were pushing us out of Treaty Gap. See, the whole thing with Treaty Gap is it was, it was right in front of, right in the very path of Dakota Access. And we had always had an encampment there, a, a, a post. So that was our very first action in August was we posted up there. And we took that. We said, nope, we're not going to let you go through here. And then they tried to go around. They tried to go to the southern part of Cannonball Ranch. So then we put an action there. We stopped them there. And then they said, well, we're going to put a road in the middle. And we're like, nah. <laughs> <laughs> so in, in October, they were, they were starting to get closer to the camp. And, and um, my brother Mika C said, I got an idea. <laughs> I was like, all right. Anyway, we said about cutting the fence and lenses and we, we went in. And this is one thing, because it's on film and it's been on the TV and everything else. And you can find it on YouTube, I will say it. It was my TP that went in, my first, I had two TPs that went in there. And um, people started camping. That was taking back our sovereignty. That was thinking outside the box, because if we had thought stayed in the box, oh, that's private land. Yeah, it had been bought by Dapple. It's private land. Um, we can't go in there. We have to stay, you know, nah. It's 1851 treaty territory, unceded treaty territory. That's my land. You see? Changing how you think. Those days at treaty camp were the most free days of my entire life. I never had such freedom. I didn't sleep very much. I think I slept four hours in all three days. But it was the most free because we were exercising our sovereign, inherent right to free, prior, informed consent those of you who don't know that language, you can look up UNIDRIP, United Nations. As indigenous populations, we have the right to free, prior, informed consent to any project that is either going to cross our lands or be near us, go through our sacred sites, which often are not on reservations. So when Kelsey Warren, this evil monster up here, um, would say, oh, we're not going through through reservation. We're not going through Indian, Indian land. That's baloney. On that treaty camp, we had had a, a tribal archaeologist walk through. Dakota Access, when they came through and after they, they got us out of there, that was a horrific time. Dakota Access tore up over 23 burial sites. We didn't tell everybody what they were tearing up. They thought they were something else, but they weren't. We knew exactly what they were. It was private land, so-called, in so-called North Dakota. But each and every one of you has the right and the responsibility to start thinking outside of what they call the box, start thinking in circular ways. Start thinking in relationship-based how you're related to somebody. If you ever notice, those of you, if you, if you meet natives, we kind of go, hey, where are you from? And they say, 
Do you know so-and-so? Hey, I'm related to that person. Or, ah, we're cousins, second times removed, but then we're family. <laughs> That's how you guys got to start thinking. Because are you going to want to hurt your family? Are you going to allow a big corporate monster, fat taker, to come in and hurt your family? Because each one of you, one of the things that we said when they came to camp, starting at Sacred Stone, Rosebud, Ocheti, and all the camps inside Ocheti, was as soon as you came in and you stayed there, guess what? Your family. You're not family just for the time you camp there. You're family from now till forever. So we have over 25,000 people that came through that are family. That's a big family. But you guys can join us. <laughs> join us. <laughs> Thank you, Joy. Um, as in the di different dynamics in the camp and how we could move forward in our movement towards protecting Unchimaka, entire Unchimaka, how do you feel like um, the seventh generation can move forward and help the leaders now today move forward, Tyrell? Um. <clears throat> To me, like, as the seventh generation, you know, uh, it was prophesied that, you know, we would, we would bring people together and, and, you know, we would unite. But the way I see it is that seventh generation, you know, that, that you know, we're, we're here to not, you know, be the flames that, that move this, but to be the sparks that create the flames for this next generation after us. You know, everything that we're learning, everything that we're doing, you know, we're going to teach to our kids. And our kids are going to teach that to their kids. You know, everything that we do, like my sister said, has a, rip a ripple effect. And there's, right now we're at a point in time where traditionally, you know, and culturally we, it's, it's different now. You know, before, everything that we would do would, you know, we would be from the guidance of our elders. And, you know, as, as youth, as young people, you know, it doesn't matter how old you are. If you're, if you're like under 45, you're, you're a kid to these elders, you know? <laughs> <laughs> and so there, we're at a time right now where, where it's like a, a shift in the paradigm where, where now we have the elders looking to the youth. You know, what should we do? You know, what, what, can, what can we do to help you guys? And, you know, it's... It's, it's, it's different for us, especially coming up in a traditional family. You know, you have to ask for forgiveness for talking in front of the elders. You know, you have to ask for forgiveness for not speaking your language. You know, if they tell you to sit down and shut up, you sit down and shut up. And now it's like, you know, they, they want us to talk. You know, they want to hear what we have to say. And, and there's also where, where the elders, you know, they come to us and they look to us, but they're also in the same mindset where they're not really sure how to feel about it or, you know, they don't know how it works either. So when we tell them something, you know, we give them our advice when we talk to them, you know, tell them what they wanted to hear and, and then it goes in one ear and out the other. You know, that happens sometimes. And it's just about, you know, the way that we were raised, you know, the way that, that you're used to. It's like muscle memory, you know, you you, you don't listen to the youth for so long, and then whenever you ask them for advice, you know, maybe not intentionally, it goes in one ear, not the other, you know, it's gone. <coughs> and so it's just a matter of, you know, being able to work, like, on both ways. Because a lot of times we have, you know, elders telling us to do stuff a certain way, and then you have other elders telling you, you know, don't listen, just do it your way. You know, what, where does that leave you? You know, so it's all about, you know, being able to to make that judgment, but not also you know thinking about it personally and how it's going to affect you personally, but but also being able to follow those you know those traditional protocols. Um, that's there's a lot of you know traditional protocols that we have to follow, 
and you know now now with this change of paradigm it's you know it's different and you know what what do we do now you know what protocols do we follow now you know do we do we make them you know do we do we keep following the old protocols but you know it's really about not not like they're giving us you know all the power or we're taking all the power it's working together with the power that they already have and the power that we already have and being able to to work it to where you know it 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 meshes together perfectly you know and and you know it's an interesting time right now in in this earth and and for us as lakota people you know being you know colonized the way that we are you know everything you know about standing rock you know screamed uh, colonization you know when when the when they came and put us on reservations you know the the hunk papa were the uh, you know the last of the the lakota to to surrender and because of that you know the the government and the church they crunched them you know they they really put the pressure on them you know they they started to convert them more they started being more brutal to them and violent you know there's 30,000 enrolled Oglala Sioux tribe members but only 9,000 hunk papas and you know that's that's sad because you know over half of the people over the age of 45 are you know they they pray with the bible you know they pray you know the the colonizers way and there's there was a difference in between the way the the Oglala or the Cheyenne you know, whenever we went up there there was a difference between the way we carried ourselves and the way the hunk papa did you know they're 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 too used to the colonization you know they were afraid you know they were at the front lines and you know it's like don't don't cross that line we're going to go to jail we're going to get in trouble and you know we show up and okay whatever jump the fence <laughs> <laughs> we're there you know and so there's you know, there's a, a lot of stuff that, that, that we have to take into accountability. You know, and, you know, I was there when, when we set up the treaty camp. You know, I, I felt that freedom. You know, we were the first ones over that line, you know. As soon as we, you know, cut that fence, that chopper was right above us, you know. You can reach up and touch it. And, you know, it's... It's all, and even then, we had the elders telling us, you know, don't, don't do that. And the entire time, from the time we set up that little outpost up there, they were saying, that's not a good idea. You guys need to leave. And, and they, they stuck their ground, you know. Nobody wanted to acknowledge that they were there for a while. And then once the construction got closer, they're like, oh, look, that's a, that's a great advantage. That's a vantage point where they're at. And everyone moved up there, boom. But you know, from the beginning, we knew that, that that was where we would have to be. And whenever they did come and raid that camp, it was, you know, it it was up to us to, to you know, try try to you know defend that piece of land. You know, that that's treaty land. You know, we all have an inherent right to be on that land. You know, our ancestors, we, you know, they spilled their blood so that we can be on that land and you know pray the way that that we were praying and you know they you know that day you know they they desecrated you know teepees and 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 spiritual belongings and and in the earth and the sweat lodge you know whenever I, whenever they arrested me and they had us sitting on the side of the road you know we know there's graves up on that hill behind us and they know it and they they sat us there on the side of the road, directly in front of construction, and they made us watch as they bulldozed our ancestors' graves. And to me, that was the most monstrous thing you could ever do. Imagine having you know, people who, who live in the South sit there and watch as, as we destroy a civil rights, or um, a civil war uh, graveyard. You know, what, what kind of reaction would, would those people have? but expect us to be okay with it, you know? And, you know, those, those days in the treaty camp, like Auntie said, you know, the, it was the best time ever. You know, 
your heart, like the feeling in your heart was just, you know, it's happy, you know, the happiest moment if you can imagine in your life. That's what it feels like. That's, that is what freedom feels like. That is sovereignty. <clears throat> That's all. In the growing um, arena and the growing number of people that are coming out for climate and environmental justice throughout the world, we have that opportunity as Native people. And, and I know that they're here in California. Um, I read a lot about um, the different agreements that were made with the different tribes in California. And I know that there were um, 20 unratified treaties that were written and, and introduced but never signed. But I was just wondering how you think, you know, as the Chumash people and how you're collaborating and how you want to move forward to, to encourage our allies in what we're doing as Native people in the environmental movement. What do you, how do you think we can go forward with that, Michael? Well, the, it would, in the Chumash um, community, the, there's only one federally recognized tribe and, or band, and that's the San Inez Band, um, which is located just over the mountains. Um, but there are several other bands that are not federally recognized. And <clears throat> when we look at how we um, approach the, the issues of um, environmental justice, how we look at uh, protecting the land and the water, oftentimes, at least over the, in the past, it has been as individual bands um, with little cooperation that is beginning to change. There are movements now to um, bring the bands together to um, work to coordinate um, the, um, the response to challenges to the, um, to the environment. And it, they're, they're in their very nascent stages, beginning stages, but there are people talking about it. And, and this is something that, um, that really is important for us to do. Um, and, and like all Native peoples, there, there are disagreements and there are um, past hurts and, and things that have gone on. But I think that um, especially the younger people have begun to look at that and say, that's the past. We need to move forward. We need to come together. And so there, there's a real push and from some elders, but from a lot of the young people to get past that and to move on. Um, and I think that when um, we look at how we do that, it's, it's basically by looking at what the ch yeah, challenges are for us. What are the threats to the environment and how do they affect? I think as Terrell said, as, as Nephew said, you know, you think about not what what has happened, but you think about how it's how what is happening now is going to affect the seventh generation. And you know, we can continue um, the the disagreements in our groups, in our bands. But if we look at the challenges, if we look at the problems we have to confront, and we consider who um, who it's going to affect. Our, you know, I, I have a new grandchild, um, just five months old now. And when I think of him and think of the world he is going to face, it makes me think I need to move beyond the old ways. You know, we need to take what the young people say, look at it with the eyes of our experience, but not let the, uh, our experiences stop us. You know, we need to move on and we need to come together. And 
this is you know one of the groups that I'm working with, Kikilik Hilo, is a grouping of indigenous peoples, not just Chumash, but other indigenous peoples um, that we consider allies that are coming together to um, be water protectors, to be earth protectors of the Santa Barbara region. Um, I know that in, in the different bands, there are people that are, are talking about um, working together and um, there are people bringing people together. Uh, there's a, a Chumash working group, which is basically Chumash um, people that work together, um, brought together by um, people who have worked with the national parks or the other groups to confront the, issue, the, the, or the federal or state um, government entities that, that we need to change. We need to get their attitudes changed. And so people are beginning to come together. They're beginning to really look at this. And I, and I think, you know, even, even though we had the experience of Uncock, of Point Conception, you know, it, it's been a long time. So I think that, that with Standing Rock, it, it brings back the idea, the whole feeling we need to work together and to go beyond what has been in the past and move on to a new future, to something that works for all our Chumash people. Um, and so there are still attempts at the state level and the federal level to not work with many of the Chumash bands because we're not federally recognized. So that's another area where we need to confront it as a unified group, as a, as a group coming together to say, you know, we're here, we are the people of this land, and you need to work with us. Um, when you sent, I know that you sent a group of youth, uh, tribal members up to Standing Rock, were there any specific preparations or were there any specific guidance or anything that you gave them when they left or you know how did you how did your group respond when when the call did come out to go to Standing Rock? I think initially um, we reacted as many people did we you know said there's an issue that is taking place there and there are people asking for for our help and our support and so we need to you know be involved in whatever way we can um, and I, it was actually a non-tribal group that brought those um, individuals together who did go to um, to Standing Rock and my my son and sister-in-law sister, daughter-in-law excuse me my son and daughter-in-law were among those people um, and they left taking supplies and taking uh, support materials to Standing Rock. Um, so I, th and, I and they were very, very um, anxious to go and to be a part of what was taking place there um, and came back very impressed, very, you know, just overwhelmed by the, the, the way things were happening. 